founder of The Money Panel and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Now this channel is here to help you understand both the practical steps of managing money, the financial education side, but also to help you understand your relationship with money because we know that behind every financial situation there's a set of thoughts, beliefs and behaviours and when we combine the practical element with the transformational relationship with money side, that's when the magic happens. Now, I'm a qualified financial advisor. I've been in the profession for 20 years and I'm a multi award winning financial coach and trainer. So make sure that you don't miss any of these videos. We put them out every single week on this channel. Hit the subscription button and the notification icon bell so that you don't miss out. So in this video, I wanted to talk to you about, first of all, some of the worst lessons that you can teach your children. And then also I'm going to share with you 10 tips as to how I believe that you can start to help your children to be good with money. Now, the reason that I'm doing this video is because on several occasions in the last few weeks, I have been coaching some clients and two of them have been financially rescued by their parents. And I actually believe that when parents financially rescue their children, it's not necessarily the right thing to do. Now, I'm a parent, I've got two children, and I can fully understand why parents financially rescue their children when they're in financial difficulties. Uh, and I'm sure if I was in that situation, that would entirely cross my mind. But the reason that I think that it's not wholly um, the best thing to do for kids is that rescuing children from often feeling the discomfort of um, associations with poor decisions around money can actually stunt their learning and their growth and their developments. And sometimes we have to go through these pain points, these challenges, and manage the challenge ourselves in order to learn those lessons. Um, so I, I, I really can understand why parents do it. But the number of occasions that I've worked with people where their parents have financially rescued them and then they haven't really then learned how to get out of this habit, this cycle themselves. And so guess what happens? The same thing happens a year later or two years later or three years later. And the reason that is, is because when someone financially comes in to rescue us, we don't actually deal with the underlying root, the underlying cause more often than not. So that's one of the worst lessons that I believe as parents that we can teach our children. Um, I also believe that teaching them that they can have anything they want, this is a pretty obvious one, um, but teaching them that they can have anything they want is not necessarily going to teach them the value of money, especially when it's related to behavior. Um, so I, I, and I've done this many occasions, but how many times as parents do we reward children financially for behavior? So think about it. When they become an adult, we don't get financially um, given money when we behave well. Um, I mean, if somebody does, then let me know because <laughs> that would be great. But, you know, if I do a good, you know, if, if I cook dinner or if I brush my teeth or if I pick up my clothes after I've, you know, stuck them on the floor after a shower. I don't get financially rewarded for that. And actually it's interesting because I know a lot of parents will give pocket money to children. Um, and I don't believe that children should have pocket money when they do household chores, because actually as adults, we don't get that financial benefit unless of course that's your job and you're a cleaner. Um, so I don't think necessarily that pocket money in relation to behaviors is necessarily a good thing to do. Um, so I'm gonna, I've just, I've got in front of me here, 10, tips that I want to give you in this video of how you can help your children to be good with money. Are you ready? So number one is to set limits. Um, so this is really interesting because from a behavioral perspective, um, it's not necessarily directly related to money, but I think understanding the, um, the, the art of patience and not kind of instant gratification is a really great lesson for children of any age to learn. Um, so for example, if you've got younger children, then setting limits on technology, for example, will just start to create them and, and to teach them the lesson of patience. And with social media nowadays and the likes of Amazon, that one click purchase, for example, you know, we have to really help our children to develop that skill of patience. Even little things actually like, um, when I was a child, we'd have constant uh, adverts on television 
nowadays, you know, everything's recorded, isn't it? It's on, we watch things on Netflix or YouTube or we watch pre-recorded movies and things like that. So everything is on demand. So I think as we have a responsibility as grown-ups and as parents to teach them the art of patience. So setting limits, I think, is one really good skill that you can help to develop for your children. The second tip is acts of kindness. This is really important because you want to be able to have a balanced relationship with money. So it's about having some spontaneity. It's about having some planning in place. It's about having some fun. It's about giving. Um, it's about status. It's about carefree. It's all of these things. We want to be able to balance out these relationships with money. So act of kindness, I think, is really important. That doesn't necessarily have to be act of kindness with money. It could be with time. And I think actually talking to children about the concept of time and money is also really important because time is pretty much the only thing that we can't buy, right? Um, and it's the most valuable thing. It's what we all want. We all want to create more money so that we can have more time and freedom. So actually talking to children about that, I think, is really important. Um, and acts of kindness can be giving up their time that could be to help a charity, it could be to support something that's going on in their school, giving some of their time to help others, and um, that could be the elderly, it could be their friends. Uh, but I think teaching them the act of kindness is really important. And, and don't forget that children will often mirror. Um, they don't always like to be told what to do, they often mirror that behavior. So if you're giving, then often they will mirror that. Um, the third tip then is to enforce consequences. Um, and again, we can relate this to behavior as well as money, but enforcing consequences is really important. You know, making the stakes small, I think, is, is quite a good example here. So sometimes it's useful for children to actually feel a little bit uncomfortable with their emotions. Um, sometimes we, we try and quash emotions. You know, if children get upset or angry, we, we kind of often go into uh, the, the automatic mode of, you know, don't cry, stop crying, or don't get, get so angry. We actually quash their emotions, which can sometimes suppress the natural feeling and emotion that, that we have as humans. So I think enforcing consequences so that they do feel a little bit of, not pain sounds awful, doesn't it? Like we want them to feel pain, we don't want them to feel pain, but they have to feel pain to feel pleasure. They have to understand disappointment that's probably a better way, disappointment rather than pain. Um, so sometimes, you know, if you're shopping, for example, and they want this, this and this, they have to sometimes go through that recognition that they can't have everything. And that there, there is a little bit of disappointment there. Because as grown ups, if we just, you know, identify we want that, that and that, and we just buy that, that and that, and we haven't necessarily budgeted for it, then that's when we can get into debt and bad debt. So I think enforcing consequences is another um, something else that you can kind of start to bring into the conversation and into your behaviors and your decisions. Tip number four then is to do things together. Um, now, little things you can do with them can make a massive difference, even if it's things like food shopping, for example, at any age, you know, whether they're little or whether they're, you know, teenagers. Um, food shopping is a great one. You can teach kids so much when you're food shopping, even things, even like little concepts like, I talk about the, the fridge freezer larder approach. I talk about what do you keep in your fridge? You know, that's your instant access bank account. What do you keep in your cupboards? That's your kind of regular savers, fixed rate bonds, you know, things that will get you a little bit more interest because you're going to lock them away for a little bit longer. Um, and then your freezer is your investments. And it's about having the balance of all three. And, you know, you think when you go shopping, you can talk to kids about you know, we're not going to just buy everything for the fridge. We're going to put some stuff in the cupboard. We're going to have a well-balanced diet. So you can really relate financial fitness to food in quite an interesting way, depending on their age, of course. Um, but also budgeting and managing money um, with food shopping as well. That can be really useful, whether you go around with one of those little zappers so they can, you know, see that you're budgeting each, each week for your food. And maybe you could have a conversation about, well, let's maybe try and shave 20 quid off our food bill this week and we're going to use that 20 pounds to put towards a fun fund or a spontaneous fund or something like that. So doing things together is really important. Tip number five is then to talk openly about money. This is so important. Um, how many of you grew up with secrets in the house around money? I'd love to know. 
Um, we don't necessarily need to go into the specifics, but I'd love to know, perhaps drop a comment underneath this video. Did you, you know, did your parents hide conversations about money? Did they never talk about money? Um, did you maybe find out that, you know, something, w money was being used maybe against, I mean, I, I've, I often saw that in my uh, childhood is that money was used very much as a manipulative tool but between my mum and my dad, because my mum and my dad were separated. We live with my mum, my dad paid my mum maintenance, but then there was always a secret conversation going on around who was my dad going to pay it directly to my mum or pay it to us. And it was always used a bit as a leveraging tool. So, you know, money was quite secret actually um, through certain periods during my life. Um, so talking openly about money is really important. Even little things as well, like um, if you're going to make an insurance claim, for example, like a private medical insurance claim or a car insurance claim or a home insurance claim or a travel insurance claim, get them involved. Just help them to understand that you can have insurances to cover you when emergencies happen or when your health is not in a good state. Um, that can really be useful for them, particularly as younger kids and teenagers. Um, you know, if they're going off to university, for example, understanding that you need to look after your things, but you can have insurances in place to cover you if things go wrong. Because then if they know that something is there, if something goes wrong, that can take away quite a lot of fear and anxiety that can often be related to money. Um, so I think renewing insurance is just a really easy one. And also talking to them about, you know, car insurance, our car insurance renewal is coming up. Um, do we pay it up front or do we pay it in monthly installments? You can talk to them about the differences between, well, if we pay up front, um, you know, we'd have, to, it, it, I would guess in that situation, you've probably got the money already saved up and you could talk to them about how you've done that. Um, but actually, if you haven't got that money saved, you could have a conversation with them to say, well, actually, we haven't been very good. We haven't saved money for this home insurance renewal, um, which now means we're going to have to do a monthly commitment. Now, that monthly commitment means that we've got less money to enjoy now. And you can start to have a conversation with them about that. Tip number six is to allow them to make their own decisions. I remember writing a blog uh, last year, I believe it was, about this one particular time when I must have been about I reckon I was about seven or eight and we were at this caravan park in France and um, I grew up with uh, three brothers and sisters and then my stepbrother and my stepsister and I remember my stepdad gave all of us five pounds and he said go to the shop the little local hypermarket in the caravan park and buy whatever you want for dinner and I, I, I believe it's the only memory I have of being given money to make a decision about what to spend it with. I'm sure I had other others, but I just can't recall any of them. And I remember buying a pot noodle. Who remembers pot noodles? And I absolutely loved it. And it's really interesting how that memory stuck in my mind. But what I loved about it is that we were able to make our own decisions as to how we spent it. And I remember, um, I, I can't remember, I think it was my older brother and my twin brother clubbing their money together and kind of coming up with this very clever idea that well actually if we pull all of our five pounds together we can buy something a bit nicer um i clearly didn't do that i just i just spent it on a pot noodle for myself um but can you see how that interesting conversation and that just giving them that responsibility can really help sometimes you know if you're going out for dinner if they're older give them an allowance give them an amount of money to go out for dinner with even if it's with you um, so that when they're choosing from their menu, they can think about, you know, well, I've, I've got £30 for this meal. How am I going to allocate that £30 out? So, it, so it, it teaches them really good habits um, at any age. So giving them responsibility, allowing them to make their own decisions. Tip number seven, then, is to reward positive money behaviours. Um, and the best example I can give of this when I was writing this out last night is I was thinking... You know, if you're working for a company and you're making a pension contribution, often your employer will match part or all of your contribution. I kind of sat there last night thinking, what a great idea. What, what would happen if for every pound that your child saves, you match it? <laughs> now, that may become a bit of a problem if your kids are saving a lot of money. But my, for my children at their age right now, so they're eight and six, you know, if today we went down to Metro Bank and paid in, I think it was seven pounds each. For, well, in fact, no, my youngest paid more than my eldest did because my, my youngest is a saver and my eldest is a natural spender. 
So my eldest always wants to hold more back and we gently kind of try and nurture that. Um, but we then matched it. And it was really interesting because my eldest was a bit like, Thomas, how much have you got in your bank? And he was like, whatever, 200 odd pounds, I think he's got in his Metro bank account, uh, in his savings account. And then uh, my eldest was like, oh, I've only got 100 and something. And you could just see his brain kind of thinking that through. Um, and there was no judgment there. There was no judgment of you should be saving more, George, because well, he has to make his own decisions. But just really interesting that just planted a seed in his mind. And because he's, you know, kids are pretty super competitive, aren't they? So um, rewarding positive money behaviors, I think, is important. So think about, you know, could you do something like matching their savings? Um, I've talked in previous videos about um, talking to them about investing. You know, if they're buying uh, Disney movies or they've got Apple products or whatever, they've got tablets, then talking to them about investing in the companies that they're familiar with is a really, really great way to get children investing. Um, so that was tip number seven. So tip number eight is to teach them that debt can be used. Um, it, essentially, debt can be used. That's what you want to teach them. You want to teach them that debt is not always bad, but debt is to be used cautiously. Um, so if you teach them that debt is bad, then debt can become a real block. It can become an issue. And actually, there are lots of situations when debt can be used if used cautiously. That's the little kind of caveat with debt. Many of you would have come across Martin Lewis's work of good debt and bad debt. You know, university fees is good debt. Um, debt potentially to, to invest in your business, depending on what that is, can be good debt. So don't necessarily teach them that debt is bad because actually that puts the fear of God into them. And then maybe if they do have to go into debt or they accidentally go into debt, that's going to put so much fear and anxiety um, into their mind about that relate their relationship with money. So just teach them that debt is to be used cautiously rather than debt is necessarily bad. Tip number nine. So we're coming up to the, the final one here is um, is to teach them how to be responsibly spontaneous. So I sat here last night thinking about my relationship with money has always been very, very spontaneous. I literally right from the first pound that I earned, um, my first job was picking asparagus on an asparagus farm. Now, in fact, my early, my first job actually, I've just remembered this, was um, mail shots. Does anyone remember mail shots? I used to, for my dad's business, I would just put letters in envelopes and we would mail shot them out. And my dad would pay us for that. I remember sitting on the carpet in the lounge. In fact, I've just literally, that's just triggered a memory for me. That's really interesting. Um, but my first job after that was uh, picking asparagus in the depths of the winter. It was horrendous. Um, but and so when I received my first pay, I would just spend it immediately um, because I had this fear that if I didn't spend it, somebody else would. And I also want, you know, I also felt like if um, I had nice things that more people would like me, um, if I bought more clothes, I'd feel skinnier because I was being bullied at school and I had eating disorder issues. I had really low body confidence issues. So when I look back at my childhood, I think um, spontaneity is not necessarily a negative relationship with money. We have to think about how that serves us as well. So the fact that I'm spontaneous, not just with money, but actually in a lot of things in my life means that I take risks. It also means that I'm a doer. So if someone says to me, right, go and launch this program, I'll be like, okay, I'll do it. And I'll just, do, 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 I'll just get it done. Whereas for other people, they'll be more like, they'll plan everything, but then they'll find the actual implementation of that difficult because the spontaneity isn't there and because they're overcautious. Whereas I'm the complete opposite. I'm very happy to take risks in my life and in my business. In fact, so much so that, you know, I get really fidgety. You know, if I've been in a house longer than two years, I've done pretty well because normally I just decorate the house and then I want to sell it and move and do something different. So I really have to kind of keep control over that. But I think teaching children how to be responsibly spontaneous, responsibly planning, responsibly carefree, responsibly status driven, responsibly um, giving with their relationship with money. Uh, it, you know, you want to create balance for them. And also spontaneous, having a spontaneous relationship with money. For those of you that feel you've been an emotional spender in your life, that creates a lot of fun. 
Um, you know, if somebody rings me and says, do you want to go to a concert tomorrow night? Yeah, sure. Like instantly I'll just be spontaneously. Yes. Whereas for some of you listening to this, you might be like, oh, no, I need to check the balance first. I need to see whether I've got the money. You need to plan ahead. Now, there's no right or wrong with either way. But I think teaching children how to have a little bit of spontaneous fun is really important. And then actually having a, a specific fund, a specific bank account or savings account that's labeled spontaneous fun for them is really important because otherwise they're just they'll just save, 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 save. And then they won't feel that they can spend any money because they'll feel guilty they'll feel full of shame some of you may resonate with some of these as well um and then the final one tip number 10 is to ignore everybody else ignore everybody else yeah you know, this is not about painting a perfect instagram picture and showing the world what actually isn't necessarily reality this isn't about keeping up with the joneses because you don't know what the Joneses are doing to have that lifestyle, you know? Um, yeah, it, comparatonitis, I think, is the biggest evil. We all do it. We all think about so-and-so's doing that. Why am I not doing that? Or so-and-so's got this. Why not? do I not have that? Um, and it's, it can be really damaging to our relationship with money, and not just with money, but in life, you know? The number of times I've been at the school gates, and I've been like, oh, like that school mum has... Like, I don't know, maybe her, maybe her children are being so good. Like the number of times I've, I've looked at babies in push chairs and been like, oh my God, my kids would never sit still in a push chair ever. And then I start judging myself like, oh gosh, like, was there something wrong with my children? Was, did I do something wrong? Did I pick them up too often? You know, you just start to create so much judgment for yourself. So I think it's really important to stay in your lane, to think about what's important for you um nobody else because nobody else is living your life it's only you living your life it's only your children living your life and you can only do your best and um, we're never going to get things perfect and there is no there's no there's no there's no like what is perfect that you're never going to achieve perfect right it's about it's about more about progress than perfection so I hope that helps. Um, so just to summarize those 10 tips for those of you that have joined uh, or watching this video later. Um, so tip number one is to set limits. Tip number two is to teach them acts of kindness. Tip number three is to enforce some consequences, get them feeling a little bit um, un uncomfortable. Tip number four is to do things together. Tip number five, talk openly about money, no secrets. Tip number six, allow them to make their own decisions, give them some responsibility. Tip number seven, reward them with some positive money behaviors. Um, tip number eight is to teach them that it's not good debt, bad debt, it's debt is to be used cautiously. Tip number nine is to be responsibly spontaneous. And tip number 10 is to ignore everybody else. So let me know underneath this video, which was your favorite. If you have anything else you want to share with me, I'd love to hear them. Drop them below and I'll speak to you all again soon. Take care. Bye.